in theoretical physics, to get this kind of audience, you have to like win the Nobel Prize or something. But uh, of course, I've been working on ML recently, and uh, it's been much more exciting. There's a huge amount of interest. So uh, to some extent, part of what I'll be talking about, maybe an implicit theme, will be sort of why there's so much excitement and why you might expect that excitement to, to continue. Um, so <clears throat> an outline of my talk is that I'll first start by um, discussing motivations for language modeling. I'm sure you're all very well motivated because this is, this is an NLP class. Um, and I'll also talk about sort of orders of magnitude of data and compute that go into contemporary language modeling. Um, and that will kind of set the stage for talking about um, scaling laws for neural language modeling. And uh, a further realization that these scaling laws seem to be quite universal for generative models and maybe for sort of machine learning uh, more generally. And then uh, finally, after discussing that, I'll talk about what happens when we actually do scale up language models. Um, I'll talk about the GPT-3 model. And if there's time, I'll talk about some lessons from all of these ideas for research, which I imagine many of you are excited to be involved with soon. So I'll start by talking about uh, why we do language modeling and Fermi estimates for language modeling. By Fermi estimates, I mean questions like estimating is it, uh, are there, are there uh, uh, a million or 100,000 or 10,000 piano tuners in Chicago? Fermi famously asked this kind of question. And there are a lot of estimates like this that we can kind of do in a back of the envelope way to really get a sense for, uh, for, for what's going on. So, um, but, but before going into that, um, why should you study language? This is sort of my motivation. You might have all sorts of other motivations. Language is obviously a very fascinating uh, <clears throat> intellectual creation by, by, by our species. Um, but I think another reason why it's particularly exciting for AI is that language is, in some sense, our species' best attempt to encode everything about the world in as efficient and compressed way as possible. And that means that, uh, that it's very yielding to, uh, to, to an AI. There isn't a lot of noise. Um, there's a lot of signal. Um, there's, of course, a huge quantity of writing freely available on the internet. And there are also a huge number of, of books. For example, uh, I think very roughly speaking, in this sort of Fermi estimate level, there's something like 10 million books in the Library of Congress. Um, and very, very roughly, that might mean there's something like a trillion words out there in books. And then there's actually much more language information out on the internet. Um, and so there's therefore a lot of data um, for, for AI models to learn from. Um, and then a, a third reason, at least for, uh, to some extent for me and maybe for many of you, is that if you're actually able to get an AI that, uh, that kind of knows, quote unquote, understands language, then you can communicate with it in a kind of natural way. You can ask it about anything. Um, and you can get a lot of intuition for, from the responses and behaviors and all sorts of different kinds of evaluations you can perform on such a model. Um, if you compare it to sort of uh, ancient history of AI, like, like excitement about classifying images from, I don't know, uh, AlexNet 10 years ago in, in sort of uh, uh, the distant past, and from, say, AlphaGo, um, again, in the distant past five years ago, um, there's a lot more intuition you can get. And that you can, you can use that to sort of understand what these models know and don't know and can do. Um, and you can also think about this in terms of how to uh, uh, make these models aligned with what humans prefer. There's a lot of work on trying to understand uh, <clears throat> language model bias, racism, um, other such issues. And, and there's really a lot that you can kind of explore and dig into. So um, I imagine this is all very basic for everyone here, but just, just so we're on the same page. Um, if you're doing kind of contemporary neural network-based machine learning, the ingredients that you need to get started are really uh, surprisingly simple. You need some kind of model um, to parameterize a function. You need a data set. <clears throat> um, you need some computers with plenty of computation. You need a loss function, and you need some choice of optimizer. And basically, for, for pretty much everything in this talk, I'll be thinking about language modeling as a task where the loss function is simply to predict the next word in uh, some sentence or paragraph or, or book. 
Um, and so that's how basically all of the models that I'll be, I'll be talking about are trained. They have a loss function which incentivizes them to, correct, to, to predict the correct probability distribution for, for the next word. Um, but what about these other ingredients like, uh, like the models that we use, the data sets that we use, and how much computation do we use? What, what are those sort of uh, order of magnitude figures? Um, so one, one way to think about this is sort of how much language do we consume as, as a person for, for comparison. So you could imagine that if you were a very voracious reader, maybe you'd read a long book every day and you'd spend your life doing that. Maybe you'd live for 70 years. If you did that, you'd end up reading something like 2 billion words over your lifetime. Um, for comparison, uh, a, a canonical large language model, GPT-3, was trained for on the order of uh, 200 billion words. So that's about 100 times more uh, language data than, than maybe you'd see in your lifetime if you kind of tried really hard to attend to, to written text. Um, there are other data sets, of course, that are much, much bigger than, uh, than GPT-3's training set. Um, uh, there's Common Crawl, which is a sort of snapshot of the internet that anyone can go out and, uh, and download if you like. And this has very roughly on the order of 10 to the 15 words. Um, I said earlier that the Library of Congress has something like uh, maybe 10 million books. Each book is maybe 100,000 words. So uh, the Library of Congress in total maybe has something like a trillion words. Um, and as another sort of smaller data set example, um, English Wikipedia is very roughly of order 3 billion words. So maybe if you spent your whole life reading Wikipedia, you could just barely do it if, if that was your mission. <clears throat> um, so what about the actual neural networks that I'll be talking about that we currently seem to be using uh, fairly effectively to model language. Um, so I'll be talking about transformer language models, um, so-called decoder-only transformer language models, uh, of which GPT-3 is an example. And just to sort of count things, um, these models have, uh, with kind of their, the standard way that they're set up, a number of parameters, which is something like 12 times the number of layers in the network. So GPT-3 has 96 layers. Um, you can make deeper or shallower such networks times the sort of activation dimension squared. So uh, D model, this, this D, D, D model parameter is just the dimension of the vector space that each token occupies, um, or, or word if you were to use to words as tokens, um, when you run this model on, on language data. Um, and so uh, this gives you some sense for, for, for where parameter counts come from. I think D model for GPT-3 is of order 10,000, and, and layer is 96, and that's how you get roughly 200 uh, billion parameters in that model, and other models uh, scale similarly. Um, now, how much computation do you actually do when you train this kind of model? Well, it turns out that uh, different neural network architectures have different properties with respect to this question, but transformers are actually quite simple um, in that in a forward pass of, uh, of a transformer, every parameter on every token performs roughly one add and one multiply, and then about twice this in the backward pass. And so that gives us a very simple formula that the number of floating point operations that a model like this performs during training is six, which is two times one plus two, um, times the number of parameters in the model, times the number of tokens, that's what D is, sort of the size of the data set in tokens, that you, that you process. And one other point that sort of I'll make while uh, kind of going over these, these, these estimates is that you might wonder whether or not there's a lot of computation involved in processing long sequences. Um, there's sort of a famous, there's a famous point that dense attention in transformer models um, is n squared with respect to context length, and that's absolutely true. However, um, if you actually work out uh, the, the sort of coefficients, the ratio of the amount of computation you do in a forward pass or, or during training um, in the context direction versus in the direction of sort of moving up 
the layers of the model, is roughly n context over 12 times d model. So um, I, I note this just because if you think, which uh, I'll kind of suggest that this is, this is a likely direction for, for the world to be heading, that models might continue to get bigger, then um, d model for GPT-3 is already 10,000. So the denominator here is order 100,000. And so actually, even if you have quite long contexts with the sort of dumbest possible dense attention, the amount of compute you actually do in the context direction is not, not always so large. Um, <clears throat> what about, so what about actually numerical values for, for this, this compute? So the largest models that we have so far, if we're in kind of Fermi estimate mode, we can round up and say they have, say, order a trillion parameters. Um, if you have a model with a trillion parameters, um, then, uh, then what kind of hardware are you going to run it on? Well, you might run it on an A100 GPU, at least this year. Um, and A100 GPUs perform about three times 10 to the 14 floating point operations per second, um, or two times 10 to the 19 floating point operations per day. Um, this means that it's sort of convenient to sometimes use units of petaflop days, which is 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second times a day. Um, and that means that's, that's about three A100 days. And that's about 8.6 times 10 to the 19 or order 10 to the 20 uh, floating point operations um, in a day. So how does, how does sort of the compute available on hardware compare to the compute that we do when we train these gigantic models? Well, if we have uh, a model with a trillion parameters and we train it for 300 billion tokens, then we get six times 10 to the 12, times three times 10 to the 11. And so we get on the order of uh, 10 to the 24 floating point uh, operations to train a trillion parameter model for, uh, uh, on one of these large data sets. So these, these numbers involved, I mean, I think the thing that I find most amazing about this is that I still remember um, taking chemistry in high school. And in chemistry, you learn that sort of a macroscopic amount of stuff is sort of an Avogadro's number of atoms, which is like six times 10 to the 23. So somehow we're actually able to build computers that do, that, that working together do more than an Avogadro's number of computations to, to train these neural models. So anyway, I, I find these numbers kind of mind boggling and, and also useful to just sort of have in, in the back of your head to understand what's, what's going on. So um, with that uh, prelude, unless there, there are any questions, um, I'll start talking about scaling laws for these kinds of language models. So um, what I'll basically be arguing is that there are very surprisingly precise empirical scaling laws for the performance um, of machine learning systems, machine learning models, as a function of kind of gross macroscopic inputs, like how many parameters does the model have, how big is the data set, and how much compute is used for training. Um, and I'll also make the point that if you're sort of in an airplane at 30,000 feet looking down on what's going on in the field, a lot of the other details in these systems don't matter all that much, or at least they don't matter as much as you might have expected that they would. Um, very often they just change some kind of constant prefactor in, in, these, in these kinds of scaling laws, which give you kind of the big picture of what's changing as you really increase uh, these, these inputs. And one way of sort of uh, turning this into sort of a, a theme, what, what do you learn from it, how do you summarize it, is that getting these models to perform better is to a large extent about kind of avoiding bottlenecks. It's avoiding being blocked by something. And there are a lot of things that, that, that can, can block improvements in performance. Um, the most obvious one, which, uh, which is what scaling laws are studying, is you could not have enough data, you could not have a large enough model, you could not have uh, enough computation to train that model. And then there are also a lot of other literal bottlenecks um, that you can think, of, think about, many of which involve sort of bad information propagation through the network. So I guess like one way that I would summarize a lot of the most highly cited papers in machine learning in the last 10 years, papers like uh, about things like, like ResNets and uh, layer norm, batch norm, things like that, is that they're sort of alleviating bottlenecks where information wasn't propagating nicely through, through your network. 
And the, the sort of simplest possible picture to sort of illustrate this, which perhaps is a cartoon of what's going on, um, something that I'll talk about later on with LSTMs, is that if you take a matrix, I mean, neural networks are really just fancy systems that do a lot of matrix multiplication. If you take a matrix and you, you multiply it a large number of times, then very roughly speaking, what you end up with is uh, a projection onto its largest uh, eigenspace. And so very roughly speaking, if you have a deep network and you sort of don't set it up correctly, it's very easy to be in a situation where uh, uh, you lose signal or lose information and you get like a literal, literal bottle. Um, but anyway, that's, that's sort of the, the philosophy that uh, at least at zeroth order might, you might sort of uh, reach from thinking about some of these results. So uh, this slide is really about the, the kind of core results for scaling laws for language models, and so I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in some detail. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to start with the plot on the far right, which is about uh, scaling laws with respect to the number of parameters in a neural network. Um, and so what we did to, uh, to, to generate this plot was get a very large data set such that we weren't worried about models overfitting at all and train all of our models for a very long time so that they were essentially at convergence. Um, so in other words, training time or compute was not a constraint on performance. And then plot the resulting test loss of language models trained to, to predict the next word as a function of parameter count um, on a, a nice log scale. And so what you see is that there's this, this power law, which is a straight line on a log log plot uh, of the loss as a function of the parameter count of these models. In the middle plot, we do the same thing, but switch the role of the amount of data that we have with parameter count. So we train a model that's very large, maybe one of the largest models on the plot on, on the right, um, so that model size is not a constraint on performance, um, on data sets of various sizes, and we apply early stopping. So we measure the test loss at the point where the test loss is at its minimum during otherwise pretty naive, straightforward training. And we find, uh, again, a very clear power law for loss as a function of data set size. And then the most complicated plot is the one on the left. So on the left, we plot all of the learning curves for many different models we provide these models with plenty of data, so they're not overfitting. They're in the, the under-parameterized regime. Um, but we, uh, we train all of these different model sizes for a very, very long time. And we measure uh, on the x-axis not the number of training steps or training tokens, but the amount of compute that has been used so far during training. And as a consequence of one of the formulas that I wrote on a couple of slides ago, that compute is six times parameter count times the amount of training data. If you take the logarithm of both sides, the log of parameters times data is log of parameters plus log of data. So what that means is that learning curves for models of different sizes are just shifted over left and right by constant amounts with the largest models uh, on, the, on the sort of the far right of this curve and the smallest models on the left. So we have the learning curves for all of these models all put together. And so a question you can ask is sort of, what is the best loss you can get for any given amount of training compute where you're allowing yourself to choose the model that, that does best for that amount of training compute? And that's what sort of the heavy black line and the orange fit are, are picking out. I mean, formally, you could call this the, the, something like the convex hull of, of all of these curves. Um, and that, again, Somewhat, somewhat surprisingly, seems to obey a, uh, a very nice power law fit over many, many orders of magnitude in computation. Um, and it's crucial for all of these experiments that you're only limiting performance with one thing at a time. On the far right, you have plenty of data and compute, but you're limiting the number of parameters. In the middle, you're limiting the amount of data, but you have a big model. On the left, you're, uh, you're looking at training compute, but you have all sorts of different model sizes and, uh, and again, plenty of data. Um, so in other words, in each of these cases, there's sort of one of these parameters that's bottlenecking performance, and uh, otherwise, uh, you have plenty of resources. There's a question? Yeah, 
Um, I hope that's not true. Um, so uh, the, there's a minus sign in the exponent. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're looking at the, uh, the, the lines or the, the function. I'm looking at the axis, right? On the bottom axis, on the right, it's the, oh, I see, okay. Yeah, they're, they're just, uh, it's just a log scale plot. Um, but yeah, please, please ask any questions. Great, and then the, the x-axis on this compute plot is this petaflop a day, per, uh, petaflop day unit. That's why it's, it's actually a small number. Any other, any other questions about uh, anything about this plot? Cool, so um, there's another thing that you can do that's kind of interesting with the plot on the left, um, which is you can ask for any given quantity of compute that you have available, um, someone kindly donates to you some number of A100s to use for, for, for a few weeks, and you want to use it to train the best possible language model you can. And so you can ask, based on this plot on the left, how should I allocate the computation that was given to me in terms of making a bigger model or training longer? And it turns out there's sort of a, a simplified cartoon for the answer that, that we found with, with our language data which was that you mostly want to allocate most of your compute, basically two-thirds on a, on a geometric scale, to making models bigger. And you can allocate about a third to training for longer on more data. And so uh, this, at least for us, wasn't, wasn't an obvious, uh, obvious conclusion. It suggests that a lot of the gains that you're going to get um, if you want to get better performance with a fixed amount of compute, a fixed budget, is going to come from making, making your models bigger. And it turns out that in practice, I, I won't go into it in detail, you can, to some extent, just make your batch size bigger during training, and that means that the total number of serial steps that you train for doesn't have to increase uh, all that much. You don't necessarily have to train for vastly longer. Um, you, you seemingly just need a uh, largely a, a bigger model. And that's something that you read off from this, this compute plot that I showed you. Um, sure. Um, so uh, that's a general question. So um, the, way that, the way that you get this graph is you basically do an analysis where you, uh, uh, where you, like, you look at any given point for compute, and you look up, and you pick out the blue curve that's closest to the black line. And that gives you a model size and an amount of training. And so you can do that um, uh, in, for, for all of these different points on the, the x-axis. And then for any given point on this x-axis, that tells you a, a model size. So you learn model size as a function of your compute budget. Um, and then conversely, you also learn an, an amount of training, which is sort of a, a, a data set size. And so that's the explanation for the, uh, for the sort of million x model size versus 1,000x in, in data. Um, uh, I, I probably won't try to explain the batch size question, but it's basically based on some empirical analysis where you ask, um, how big can you make your batch size? How far can you push data parallelism um, without seeing diminishing returns? And that's, that's sort of the rough answer from, from that. Question? They're all trained from scratch. So this is always... Uh, almost everything that I'll talk about in, in this talk is training from scratch. Any other questions? Okay. And then another point that, uh, I mean, I don't want to overemphasize, but like I said, from a sort of very zeroth order uh, naive perspective, is that um, for some of these results, architecture isn't the most crucial thing. So I think one of the biggest advances in, in machine learning um, in the last five or 10 years has been the development of the transformer models that I'm talking about. But of course, you can do language modeling with a recurrent model that reads words in order. Um, and of course, LSTMs or stacked LSTMs are sort of the standard way, way, to, way to do that. Um, and so you can compare what you actually get if you study LSTMs versus, versus transformers. And at zeroth order, uh, it doesn't seem like LSTMs are so bad. It looks like as you make them bigger, they are scaling up quite nicely. But there's basically a constant offset where transformers are something like five or ten times more efficient for a given model size than LSTMs. 
Um, and so I think this is a very, very convincing plot that tells you that transformers are, in fact, better. But, uh, but you don't necessarily need a transformer to, to see that making models bigger is, is, giving you, is giving you a win. And really, the sort of more interesting limitation of LSTMs uh, that I'll also talk about a little more later is if we plot something else. So if we look at uh, uh, 1,000 tokens, which is something like 600 words of context, um, we can look at what the loss is as a function of the position in the context, because if you've read more of a document already, you're going to be better at predicting what the next word is because you have more context available. And there are very smooth, it turns out, also power law curves for uh, uh, the, the loss as a function of, of context position. But the thing that you notice is that the red lines are LSTMs and the blue lines are transformers. And LSTMs tend to sort of plateau in performance after on the order of 100 tokens. Um, and this is sort of another, another a bottleneck in a different direction. Um, this is the famous fact that transformers are much better at learning long context information. Um, and this is obviously a limitation of LSTMs. Um, but, but sort of the basic parameter scaling law uh, seems like it holds for, for, for many architectures. And then there are much more refined questions you can ask. I won't go into too much detail on this. But there are all sorts of hyperparameters in, in transformer models. And you might ask, how much does it matter if I really optimize those? Do I get qualitatively different behavior if I optimize those better? And what all of these plots show is that for various different kinds of hyperparameters in transformer models, there's some broad basin where you get quite good performance. I mean, maybe a factor of three in, in either direction, where performance doesn't change all that much. Of course, you might want to optimize it. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But, uh, but kind of qualitatively, it's not, it's not an enormous dif difference. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is also a place where it's, uh, I, so I'm going to tell you in a few slides that a lot of these features are true more generally beyond language. Um, and they, they really sort of say that, uh, that, that much of what's going on when, when machines learn is, is quite universal. But there are features that are, are non-universal. So this is kind of a nicer <coughs> uh, plot of loss versus token index. Um, and I've included some power law fits, which are dotted lines, which show that uh, uh, this is actually, this, this performance is also, is also highly predictable. Um, that just says the obvious that when you read more, you understand you're, it's easier for you to predict what's coming next. Um, but you can train models on images. I'll, I'll briefly talk about that later. You can train models identically on images. And there you see a performance as a function of context position that's very different. So here you have a model that reads pixels row by row. And as you might expect, there's usually much more non-trivial stuff going on in the middle of an image rather than in the background. And that's represented by the fact that models do much worse. Their loss is higher in the center of images as compared to near the edges. So while some properties of, of transformers and language models are universal, and I'll talk about those uh, uh, later on, there are features of language data that are totally different from, from other data distributions. And this is a very stark uh, example of that. Um, but generally, the fact that there are these kinds of nice patterns lurking whenever you optimize a model, um, I think that is, that is, is very common. So any questions um, about this? Yeah. Do you mind going back slide? Do you mind explaining what it means to have a loss on the first token versus the thousand token? Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, so if you, if you imagine you have a thousand words extracted randomly from a book, then the very first thing you can ask the model to do is try to predict the very first word. Um, then you ask it to predict the second word, the third word, et cetera. Um, the very first word, basically all the model can possibly do is predict the unigram distribution for its training set. It just doesn't have any information to go on otherwise to, to, to predict what's happening. And so that's why its loss is very high. Um, but by the time you get to the end of the passage, you've read some, a lot of some little short story, and you know a lot about what's going to happen. You know what kinds of words are likely to, to come next. You know about the author's style and vocabulary. You know about what characters exist, et, et cetera. Um, and so your, your model has gotten much, much better at prediction by, by the end of the context. And so literally to make this plot, you take maybe 1,000, 10,000 different passages with 1,000 words in them, 
you compute the model's loss on uh, all of the words in the passage, and then you take the mean, and you get some nice plot like this. Yeah? I'm trying to clarify, because um, the com computational complexity is quadratic um, with respect to token index, would that mean that essentially for token index, if, if you think about it, if you were looking at compute, then it would go uh, from 10 to 0 to like 10 to the 6th. So you'd, uh, you'd have significantly greater compute um, for a given test loss as you increase token index. So um, it's true that if you make the context length longer and longer, you will spend somewhat more compute. Um, but the fraction of the amount of compute you spend near the last token um, isn't, isn't nearly so stark. Most of the compute happens in the uh, matrix multiplies for the MLP feed forward part of the transformer and also the uh, matrix multiplies to make the keys and queries and values, et cetera. Um, that's actually in, in most, well, it depends on, it depends on the, the model hyperparameters, but in many models, especially models that are large, that's actually the predominant compute. And so actually the amount of compute you do for the last token and the first token might only differ by a few percent. So for GPT-3, I think it's literally like one or two percent difference. So, so matrix multiply dominates the tension in terms of... Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, the formula for that was this one that I, I, I briefly mentioned here. So basically how much compute you do in the context direction divided by the amount of compute you do in the like matrix multiply direction is, is this. So if your model is, if D model is very small, like if D model is 128, and n context is 1,000, then it's basically 50-50. But if D model is 10,000 and n context is 2,000, then it's like 2%. So if the models keep getting bigger, then that means that if you're, if you're willing to pay a fractional cost, then you can keep making context length longer and, and pay a fixed fractional cost. Um, and of course, if you use something fancier than dense attention, you also get extra wins on top of that. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so uh, this is sort of uh, uh, both of these, uh, the left and the right, show you samples from uh, a transformer model. Um, very roughly speaking, they're identical kinds of transformer models, but just with some slightly different hyperparameters. But they're trained on very different data distributions. The one on the left is obviously, this is GPT-3. The one on the right is uh, IGPT. It's, it's a model that's trained to predict pixels row by row. And so what, what happened here was that uh, we took the top half of an image and then generated all the rows, uh, rows beneath. And so the same kind of model architecture, but just trained on different data distributions, is sort of able to effectively learn very impressive uh, uh, generative capabilities um, in, 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 in both cases. And so this is sort of a qualitative hint at sort of the possibility that what's going on here is, is quite universal. And, um, and so another way of introducing it is say, you might have some questions after the last few slides. Are the scaling laws I'm talking about really specific to language? Are they a feature of the kinds of data that language is? Um, you might ask, do these scaling laws really continue? You showed that they're true over many orders of magnitude, but may, do they break down eventually and in what way? And then another question you, you might ask is, what do they imply for other kinds of evaluations? Um, you probably don't just want to generate raw samples from, from either of these kinds of models. You might want to use them um, for some other more specific task. And so there's a question of whether or not um, the test loss, the training loss that you've optimized, as that goes down in a predictable way, does that also imply that other things, other capabilities of the model are, are improving? Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about these questions. So um, this plot um, uh, contains, uh, this plot contains kind of a lot of compressed information all at once, or the set of plots. So this is the result of what happens if you train the same kind of transform models on uh, sort of five different data distributions. So text, language we already saw, um, but you can try video where you predict every pixel in a video um, in this sort of rectang rectangular prism of, of video pixels. Um, images, um, the sort of synthetically generated deep mind math, math data set where you're trying to predict the answer to math problems. Um, there's a multimodal data set. 
um, where you have image text pairs um, in either direction. And in all cases, uh, the x-axis is compute, and the y-axis is the appropriate test loss uh, for, for that class of models um, minus a, a constant. So uh, uh, that's, that's the, one, uh, the, the one complication that, that, that I've added here. So um, <clears throat> the, the claim is that these dashed lines in terms of the original loss are a power law, um, like the power laws that we saw on, on a much earlier slide, plus one constant term. Um, and if you subtract off that constant term then, and you make a log-log plot once again, then you once again get these very, very nice straight lines. Um, and so this compute scaling law generalizes to all these other data distributions. And the other scaling laws also generalize. Um, I, just, I just haven't plotted them. Um, so the claim of this slide is that uh, scaling laws do generalize to all of these other data distributions when you train the same basic kind of model um, uh, on them. And furthermore, there's sort of an intellectually slightly interesting uh, point, which is that if you really believe that the sort of uh, that these these dashed lines are are true, if you think that they're a real feature of what's going on, and they continue out very 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 far, then if you think that the loss is a constant plus a power law, then you can interpret the constant term as the entropy of the underlying data distribution. And you can interpret the power law as something like the KL divergence between the true data distribution and the model that you have. Um, so that's a lot. The important summary at zeroth order to remember is that I'm telling you that the kinds of scaling laws I presented for language generalize to all of these other, other domains. There's also some other, other interesting features here. Um, the reason why I used compute to illustrate that the scaling laws generalize is because you can ask another question now that puts all of the different data distributions on one plot. It wouldn't have made any sense to combine the five plots on the last slide into one plot because the test loss when you're predicting a word is not in any way comparable to the test loss when you're predicting a pixel. It doesn't really make sense. They don't have the same units. They don't... They're, it doesn't make sense to put them together. But something that does make sense to put together is what the optimal model size is as a function of your computational budget. And so um, in the same way that we did for, for language, you can go here and you can ask for any given amount of compute, like 10 to the minus 2 petaflop days, what is the best model size? You can do that for all of these plots, combine that information together, and you find something kind of surprising, which is that Again, roughly speaking, if you're sort of willing to, to, to allow a little bit of wiggle room, um, all of these different kinds of models seem to be on the same trajectory for optimal model size uh, versus, versus compute. Um, there's some kind of universal fit of how much bigger you should make your model if you're going to model uh, any of these data distributions um, with some given amount of compute. Um, so what about other kinds of tasks? Well, one of the most classic tasks that you can ask about in ML is uh, image classification. And so um, the models that we are training on images and that, that I've, I've shown you plots, their, their training loss, um, these models are sort of on tiny little images predicted pixel by pixel. Um, in particular, there are 32 by 32 images. So we can look at sort of the 32 by 32 pixel version of ImageNet classification. And the models that I was discussing are generative models that predict pixels, but you can chop off their heads, add a classification head in, in, it, in, in, it, in its place, and try to predict ImageNet and train on ImageNet. And the orange curve that I've shown you here is what happens if you just take a randomly initialized model with that architecture and train it. Um, you get very good performance up to a point, and then performance plateaus because um, you're being limited by the fact that ImageNet is from this point of view, a small data set. However, if you take these pre-trained models that have been trained generatively to, to, to draw pixels, they, they sort of use the features, presumably they're using the features they learned um, from image generation um, for classification, and so you get some nice 
trend for the uh, error rate in classification um, as a function of, of model size. So this is saying that uh, in this particular case, we actually do fine tuning. Um, the pre-training that you did and the sort of trends you saw really kind of transfer into trends in something else you might care about, like image classification. Um, we can ask the same kinds of questions um, about language models. Um, in particular, does this steady improvement in, image, in language modeling as a function of scale, um, does that translate into, into, into better performance? And this is sort of an interesting subject by itself, and so you can ask what happens if we scale uh, uh, language models. And so this is sort of this exact same plot that you've seen a couple of times now for language models, but it just uh, increased from sort of original work that we did out to this yellow line, which is, which is GPT-3. Um, and you see that basically this, this sort of trends continue. Possibly GPT-3 is sort of missing the trend a little bit. Um, I can't really honestly tell you whether that's because GPT-3 wasn't well optimized or if it's because uh, uh, there's some bending in this curve where we're hitting some irreducible loss. Um, that irreducible loss would be something like the entropy of this sort of language data set uh, itself. But, but it's just the order the, the sort of trends continue. And uh, what's now, I think, pretty well known is that if you train fairly large language models, then they can sort of exhibit in context learning. So um, <clears throat> the kind of learning that, that, that I'm talking about is that you give these models an example of many arithmetic problems or many uh, uh, anagrams or, or, or whatnot, or translation tasks for, for individual words, then um, early on in the sequence at the top, they might not be very good at doing the task, but they figure out what the pattern is in the task and they learn to do it. And in particular, you can, you can plot that. So you can ask for, say, like one of these anagram tasks. Um, what is the performance of the model as a function of how many examples of the task it's seen in the context? So this is kind of similar to the loss as a function of context position, but it's now an accuracy at doing an actual task, like unscrambling the letters in a word. And you see, probably most importantly, that if you give more examples, you get significantly better performance, starting from very, very poor performance to, to, to pretty good. And also you see that larger models do this better. Um, you also finally see that giving a natural language prompt with some instructions helps significantly in the regime where you have very few examples. Um, this, is, this is in context learning. It's, you can call this a kind of meta learning. Um, and it just emerges automatically from training large language models. Um, without uh, without any particular attempt to to get this kind of get this kind of behavior, um, and you could also ask sort of about downstream tasks that you actually you care about. Um, so there is accuracy at doing arithmetic as a function of model size, a, a bunch of different kinds of arithmetic problems. Um, there is uh, just some data set of analogies from a, a, a test that American college students take to to go to college. Um, the SATs, um, and I, if you care, the sort of average score of that year's test was, I think, 58 or so percent. So the largest model is sort of doing a little bit better than the average uh, American high school student. Um, the uh, trivia QA, which is sort of just knowing trivia, and uh, Winograd schemas are, are problems like uh, if, if a tree falls on your roof um, and you got it fixed, what did you get fixed? Did you get the tree fixed or your roof? Um, it's a measure of common sense reasoning, and models are also getting better at this. And I think the, the other interesting thing that's, that's very often emphasized is that clearly trivia performance is improving very smoothly as you make models bigger. The models are just remembering more and more trivia. Um, uh, Winograd schemas are also improving fairly smoothly. Um, but then there are examples like arithmetic where models are very poor, and then they sort of suddenly get pretty good. Um, and so uh, these kind of sudden uh, grocks where the model sort of suddenly kind of like gets what it's supposed to do for arithmetic are, are pretty interesting. I mean, there are all sorts of other kind of interesting things if you kind of dig into these specific capabilities. Yeah? Why bigger models do better in context learning? Um, I mean, I guess the sort of, the sort of dumb zero-throwter point is that 
larger models are just getting much better and better at predicting the next word given more and more context. So I think it like I think there's a very tight connection between a plot like this and these sort of in context learning plots. Um, basically, the more information you're getting, I mean, all of these models probably know the unigram distribution of, of words and tokens pretty well. Um, but the bigger model is getting much, much, much more information from its context than the smaller models. And at a certain point, I mean, it depends on your training distribution and all sorts of other things, but like uh, a certain, uh, one of the things that we do is when we see several examples of something happening in a text, we guess that, that that's, that's what we're going, to, we're going to see next. And that's really probably embedded in a ton of text that's, that's out there on the internet and in books. And models have to decrease their loss somehow. That's a pattern in the text. It's a, a pattern that models eventually learn, and they seemingly apply this knowledge. I think there are other people, of course, who've kind of worked on this question more specifically. I might have more specific theories, but I think in like kind of an intuitive sense, that's, that's how I would think about it. Um, I guess one final evaluation you can ask, do, can people tell that text written by a language model was written by a language model um, or that it's a human? This is an evaluation where uh, we looked at short news articles. There's, I think, two or three paragraphs and generated equivalent news articles from GPT-3. And by the time you get to sort of the largest models, people are approaching chance accuracy at being able to tell the difference. This sort of has a lot of implications, both, I mean, it's it's... It's interesting and surprising as a statement about language modeling, um, but it's also, uh, it's also somewhat scary. Um, it means that these language models are, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to tell that you're talking to, to a language model if you don't have a very long conversation. Um, yeah. Hi, um, so I'm wondering, if, okay, so for this specific story, for example, because um, with larger models, they're more prone to memorization. So have you examined, like, if the generative article are original or not, and are not connected to anything? That's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that question for this particular analysis off the top of my head. Um, I believe that, they, uh, that these are not memorized. Um, one simple thing you can do, at least for, for some things that occur frequently, is like you can look at the distribution of the loss for a model on its own samples. Um, and at least for, for things that are, memori that, are, that are very clearly memorized, um, usually they, of course, probably they occur frequently in the training set, but also the loss tends to be like much, much lower on memorized samples because, I mean, you can sort of intuitively understand this because like if there's 100 words that are exactly verbatim uh, sampled out and you're sampling at sort of temperature equals one, then all of the next word predictions have to be extremely, extremely confident. And that means the loss has to be super low. So, I mean, just informally, something that I've done to, to just get rid of memorized samples is compute the loss. And usually you'll just see a pretty clear bimodal where there'll be a few memorized examples and then things that aren't. Um, that's a simple thing you can do to check. You can also, of course, do, do, do deduplication. I, I don't remember off the top of my head what deduplication was done here, though. Um, on the downstream tasks section, is there more to say about how scaling loss work? Did you look at um, transfer level contexts and adversarial contexts? Um, I don't think I have anything particularly clear to say about that. Um, I mean, these these evals I think are not adversarial in the sense that they're just uh, they're just few shot evaluations with some some fixed data set. Um, there are a large number of different kinds of adversarial. Uh, data sets out there for reasoning, for, for common sense knowledge, for, for truthfulness. So, I mean, there's like, for example, truthful QA um, famously is an example where there aren't any trends like this and, and arguably the trends go downward, although it depends on your training distribution and some models actually do improve. So I think, uh, I think that's a complicated question. I think it's hard to find examples where the trends go down. I don't think it's easy, but, but, they're, but they're, these do exist. Any other questions? Great. Um, so um, I guess I'll, I'll sort of end by summarizing some, some lessons that you might draw kind of pretty practically for, for research from this. Um, and then uh, I can either open it up for questions or, or 
I can, I can also, I can always talk infinitely long. I've been a professor for like 10 years of my life, so I can just talk forever. Um, but, but I'll sort of end after talking about some, some lessons. Um, so I think one lesson that, that kind of I draw from this is that kind of scanning over some of the important inputs to your training process is just a pretty useful thing to do when you're doing ML research. And it's sort of typically very cheap. It's cheap because generally most things vary in an important way on a log scale or, or sort of on a geometric scale, however you want to say it. Um, and that means that like, if you're training with the data set of size D, maybe you should also train with D over two and D over four and D over eight or something like that. And if you sum that geometric series, you get 2D. So you sort of, I mean, you made your training process twice as expensive in some sense, but, uh, but it's, not really, it's not really a big change in, in what you have to do. But you can often like, learn a lot about what's going on by, by doing these kinds of scans. Um, so I mean, this is an example of some, some data that I didn't show earlier. But something you might wonder about is what happens if you scan over data set size and model size at the same time. Um, and it turns out there's some very simple trends that you can model in that case, too, that tell you about things like overfitting. Um, and I mean, if you care about overfitting, then this tells you about something like how big do you have to make your data set for a given model size to avoid overfitting being a significant problem so that you can answer all kinds of questions like that. Um, and I at least find that this, this is kind of useful and, uh, and it's nice um, for learning things about, about behavior. And I think alongside that, I think like um, this, is, this is sort of a, a joke. This isn't real. This is sort of making fun of a, a large number of machine learning papers that you, you might see. Um, I think a lot of machine learning papers have tables like this. Um, and it's sort of hard to tell from like this kind of table. Obviously, I'm making fun, but I think it's not so unrealistic. Like, did the technique that went into our model really improve on, on other things that happened? Um, and I think that this kind of plot, at least for me, is a much more convincing statement that like, well, clearly transformers are just better than, than, than LSTMs. Um, so the, the slogan here is sort of success for new techniques. If, if your goal is to sort of improve a model, um, uh, if that is your goal, then I think it's, it's, it's at least to me much more convincing and kind of clearer what's going on if you see these trends. Um, maybe I have another slide making fun of this. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is a thing that I actually see very often in research, um, is that you come up with some new idea and um, you uh, see, like, you, you first do the cheapest, easiest experiment, and you see, wow, my new idea improved performance. I'm really excited. Um, uh, everyone should, should, should adopt this. And, um, but then you, you make some plot like this, and you sort of say, oh, OK, I guess it, 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 it doesn't really matter that much uh, at all. And I think this is, this is actually a common. I mean, I think we all have all sorts of ideas. Um, I mean, people, people fall asleep at night, and they can't sleep, and then they wake up, and they, they have ideas, and they're like, oh, I'm going to go try this. We all do it. Um, but, uh, but oftentimes they don't work. And I think this, this is sort of useful for understanding whether your idea really, really works. Um, and I mean, if all you're ever going to do is train this model, then your idea did work. But I think that like, there's sort of an expectation that, uh, that, that probably people will be using bigger computers to train larger models in the future. And so the ideas that are really going to have a huge impact are ones that sort of point in the opposite direction. Um, I've even seen ideas where on small models, they make no difference at all. But on larger models, they, they, they do better. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this, these kinds of trends, I think, are useful. Um, and they're certainly useful to think about. Um, another point that, uh, that I find useful, um, uh, I think it's not sort of obvious. And maybe you shouldn't trust it completely, is that I tend to think, I mean, because I've sort of swallowed my own Kool-Aid, um, uh, that if something works, then it should scale fairly predictably. That's not always true, but for things that you can measure that are very close to your optimization target, um, if sort of your training, per, your training process, your hyperparameters, et cetera, are all kind of set up well, then I, I tend to think that you should see some kind of predictable trend. And if that trend uh, goes away, then, I mean, maybe that's just, that's just exactly what's true. But I think often it means that there's something broken about, about what's going on. Maybe your numerics are broken, and you need higher precision in some part of your model. Maybe, uh, maybe there's some bottleneck you hadn't thought of. Um, so I mean, this is also an example that kind of scaling, predictable scaling kind of can be found all over the place. So. Um, I, I just think this is sort of neat. 
Um, so if you just train these extremely naive, very stupid multimodal models, or you use a decoder-only transformer to either model the text based on the image or model the image based on the text, then you can measure a sort of empirical mutual information between the image and the text. How much information did the image give you about the words um, in the sense of sort of Shannon information? Um, and Or conversely, how much information did the text give you about the image? And this is also a place where, I mean, this is very close to the optimization target. The whole point of the multi-model is to, is to get this information. And you see that there's some predictable scaling going on where larger models are getting more information about one data, one part of the, uh, the distribution for, for, for the other. Um, but I think this is sort of a, a general thing that, uh, that you should expect um, in, in model training. Um, and so maybe to sort of summarize, maybe even bigger picture implications, um, I think that these kinds of results suggest that um, it may not be the best or the smartest or the most interesting way to, to make better ML models. Maybe it won't be the, the, the way that, uh, that happens in the future. But at least I think these results kind of suggest that there aren't any really hard conceptual barriers preventing people from training significantly more powerful models of all sorts of, uh, of all kinds, including, of, of course, language models um, in, in, in AI research. Um, I think um, certainly my perspective originally as a physicist sort of coming to, to machine learning um, uh, kind of in a sort of fresh new way five years ago um, is that, I mean, this, this is sort of one set of abstractions for thinking about kind of what's going on in, in, in AI research um, that you, if you're going to be training fairly large models and you want them to do well, if that's a thing that you're going to do, um, then you probably want your models to sort of be scaling well in terms of their performance. And I think this, this framework of maybe there's a bottleneck, but if you remove the bottleneck, then, then you'll just continue to see further progress, um, I've, I've found, found useful. Um, uh, I think another point that, that uh, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll make this point at the end. Um, another point is that, uh, yeah, scaling laws are just sort of all over the place, and, and they can help you to sort of uh, uh, maybe organize your, your research a bit. Um, and then, I mean, maybe the most interesting point conceptually, though, is that it seems like if you believe this kind of story, that it seems like many domains of ML are, are kind of surprisingly simple and, and universal, things that you might not have thought are, are the same or more similar than they are different. Um, and of course, this is also a fascinating thing to try to, to understand. So, um, I mean, I was a theoretical physicist for most of my life, so I mostly tried to uh, like understand things that seem extremely esoteric and weird, and, and why would anyone care about them? Um, this is a thing that, that I think probably, probably everyone in this room kind of cares about, like, can AI models write? Can they, can they communicate in language? And um, these kinds of trends are really, really nice. They're the kind of trends that you might see in a very controlled physics experiment or something, um, and yet they're coming out of something very, very noisy and random, like predicting language data, data on the internet. And so I think it's very interesting to think about like, why are these kinds of trends true? What is the underlying kind of theory or, or science here that makes these trends true? Can we predict it? Um, can we refine those predictions? Can we understand why when this does and doesn't occur? Um, another question is sort of, there's some exponent here. This is a straight line, but the straight line represents a power law with a particular exponent. Why that exponent? For language, it's like 0.08 or so. Why 0.08 and not 0.2 or 0.4 or 0.001? Um, I think there are all sorts of questions here. When you see data that has a very clear trend, it's very interesting to understand, to try to think about why is something so, so simple happening? Um, and I'll sort of leave you with that. Yeah. Um, you, have you thought any about how these scaling laws sort of relate to human beings? So, I mean, your picture is essentially make everything bigger, avoid bottlenecks, and it'll all be good. <laughs> um, whereas, I guess for human beings, so you're, you're good on the number of parameters, because there's still several orders of magnitude headroom there, but it seems like you're not 
very good on the amount of compute because human compute is very constrained both in the amount they consume because of the slow processing but just also because of the energy demand, right? They can actually be using most of their parameters most of the time. Um, and data is a little bit complex because I guess we get a ton of, you know, live video data coming at us all the time. But certainly if you're thinking about the amount of language data we get, you know, um, sort of fully competent language users are sort of three orders of magnitude down from where GPT-3 is now. And, um, but yet something good seems to happen as human abilities to learn. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's a fantastic question. I don't have anything to say that isn't quite speculative. Um, so, I mean, I don't have any good answer to the question. I think it's a great question. I guess one thing that seems like it's true is that sort of the factor of a thousand you mentioned seems pretty common. Um, I mean, my impression is that AlphaGo probably plays like a thousand times more games when it trains than, uh, uh, than like a Go Master does. Um, I think. I think this is a pretty common factor to see in a lot of like ML, ML contexts, but I have no idea why it is. I don't know if it's that evolution optimized us to learn fast, if we have some hard-coded information, if the sort of multimodal inputs that we have help a lot. Um, you might imagine that when you have a system that's already pretty smart, reinforcement learning or active learning of some form becomes more and more important because like when these language models or, or a person, like if I read, if I read a, a, a physics textbook, I don't really learn a lot in a certain sense um, because I already learned physics. And I think the same is probably true for these models. So as the models get smarter, this sort of very dumb next word prediction task is giving you less and less information, but you might expect to get more and more information uh, if, you, if you did something more, more active. Um, I can continue to speculate, but it's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't really know anything about, uh, I don't have anything, uh, sort of well established to tell you. Um, it's a great question. Fair enough. But compared to the transformers and the LSTMs, you know, when the LSTMs cracked out at some point, yeah. they literally cracked down. The transformers were a bit better, but they were sort of similar. Whereas it seems like human ability to learn relative to amount of data and compute seems on a very different place on the graph. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely I think it just true. I mean, the sample efficiency of these models is not similar. I, I mean, another way of saying it is just that if you got into AI research to understand the human brain, it's very unclear whether we're making any progress on that. But, uh, but, but if we just want to sort of, uh, yeah, if we, if, if, if for, for a lot of these tasks, that doesn't, we don't seem to have to solve the brain to solve uh, to solve AI surprisingly. Other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Sure, sure. No, these are all great questions. Um, so, I mean, f sort of early on, I commented on some sources of data, and I mean, you're certainly correct about quality. Um, I think in terms of quantity, I mean, I don't think anyone has the like a digitized Library of Congress, but I think if you did, that would be like, I don't know, maybe 10x bigger than the training set for GPT-3. So there's a sense in which there's probably quite a lot of s still quite high quality data that isn't in use. Um, I, I don't know whether it will ever be in use. I mean, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Um, and then if you, if you are willing to sort of take all of this garbage on the internet um, or try to filter that garbage down, um, I think, I don't know how accurate this estimate is, but at an order of magnitude level, you can get something like 10 to the 15 words, which is a thousand times bigger. And of course, if you find any kind of intelligent way of filtering, then uh, if, you, if you can filter down to 0.1% of that and take the 0.1% that's best, then you do still have a lot of data. So I think for language modeling, there's definitely still some headroom, um, but this is, this is certainly a, a constraint. Um, and, 
and there are other kinds of data distributions where, where you'll, you'll run out uh, sooner. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there are all sorts of other things one can explore. One can explore multimodal models. One can switch to a different kind of loss function um, that uh, is more interactive or, or actually accomplishing a task. But, uh, but I think for pure language modeling, it seems like there's at least some room left. And if you think that your model size increases sort of, if you, if you think you can increase your model size by a factor of 100 and increase your data set size by a factor of 10, which is sort of like um, roughly, what, roughly what this is saying, if you believe that, um, then you can still scale up your model size a lot and have probably plenty of data. Um, but uh, yeah, we're very, I mean, if you couldn't sort of do this stuff without the internet. Yeah, or you know. Did you want? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, in, in terms of bottlenecks for um, improvement on tasks over time, are you more optimistic about uh, progress in, in hardware systems, like enabling much larger models on the same architectures, or improvement, like architectural improvements, like the LSTM and transformer? Um, I guess, I mean, I, I think I'm sort of optimistic about both. Um, I think that. The, my understanding, sort of the zeroth order understanding of the hardware situation is that like connecting together GPUs and GPU like objects works pretty well. And that like uh, interconnection speeds are increasing and can increase pretty easily. So I think that uh, you don't need one chip to run your entire model. You can distribute your model over many, 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 many accelerators. And I think uh, I think you can do that if you're willing to pay for those accelerators, et cetera, then I think, I think you can do that. Um, architectural improvements, I think, uh, I would say sort of uh, typically haven't been super excited about architectural improvements, but, uh, but I, I, I think there will continue to be architectural improvements. I think that sort of whenever you do something for the first time, or even just like whenever you train a really big model for the first time, you sort of don't do it in the best possible way, and, and there's a lot of like, all sorts of different kinds of improvements. Maybe there are sort of non-incremental improvements that will look like big jumps. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think there'll be both. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which if all you did was look at this plot and just try to continue it, that might be an underestimate of progress that the field is going to make because there will be uh, uh, there will be improvements in in architecture and algorithms and things like that. on the data set because that's um, like continuing the question from the, the previous question about the data. Um, we can theoretically have like a data set with similar entities just like how we do data augmentation to do addition, but like maybe make that step somewhere down somehow and then we can theoretically have increasing growth data just scaling along like on the fall part or getting reinforced by this type of like almost synthetic data. I think that's a great question. Um, I think the sort of simplest version of this, well, a simple version of it that, that I think is probably important and, and increasingly important is sort of just reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning in a certain sense is a situation where you generate your own data because like if you have a language model doing RL, then it writes something and then you're, you're training on that data. So I, I definitely do think that that will sort of augment data and mean that, uh, that, that there will be other avenues for improvement. Um, literal data augmentation itself seems also seems plausible to me. I think it's not happening a lot because there still is more just language data out there. But yeah. Um, so I have two questions. First one's real quick. Uh, just coming from a non-computer science background, I'm just interested in like how, like what about associating with the language field or just general, all general, like got you really excited about that in physics. And the second part is, uh, you know, in your research before this, I'm sure you dealt a lot with different types of scaling laws. Like, you know, I kind of I stopped at LinkedIn already, so I'm like, it's a lot. But I kind of like trying to see to this, to this type of stuff. Are there any findings that you found particularly surprising or unexpected? Uh, you know, just with your, your past experiences. Like, at least like, when I look at this, a lot of it looks like just, almost as it's natural and like what I would expect. But uh, for you, like other than this, or like other stuff that you're doing, like I know, like with your your research stuff right now, like is there anything that is kind of like, ooh, like this is like almost a top notch or not even 
or just like particularly uh, surprising? I think to me the most surprising thing is uh, of these sorts of results was probably that there is a very, very precise trend, it seems like. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think this is, this is sort of an unusual thing. And I think when I saw that, I thought it was a really big deal. Um, I think that, like, usually, like, I mean, it's just not, it's not true in most many things you plot. I mean, obviously, there are other plots that don't show this kind of trend, even if they're reasonable. I mean, like, like I don't know. I mean, there's sort of a trend in trivia QA, but, but I don't really know what that means. But I think, I think, I think the fact that there's something seemingly very precise is, I, I view that as, like, a very intriguing entry point to, like, try to dig into something because it means that there's probably some deeper reason. And then the fact that it's, seems fairly universal across data distributions, again, set, suggests, suggests something like that. Um, yeah, the, the, the main difference between data distributions is the, these exponents uh, in the scaling laws are different. Um, in terms of, like, coming from physics, um, I mean, I think I got into, like, a lot of this stuff partly because I'm fairly mercurial and, and I, was, I was interested and, and a lot of other friends I had were interested and so we sort of studied it and, and, and it went from there. I had friends, et cetera. Um, uh, but I mean, from another point of view, I think I got involved in it uh, uh, for really weird reasons, perhaps, in the sense that like, I just know a lot of people who are already in sort of, I don't know, 2015, talking about things like, wow, is like, uh, are, how much better is AI gonna get? Um, what are the implications going to be for the world? Um, is this going to keep improving at, 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 a, at a drastic clip? Um, what are we going to do to sort of make sure that these models are, are aligned with human values, to use the kind of usual sort of phrase that's, that's, that's now used? Um, and, uh, and I sort of thought these people were weird and crazy, even though they were friends of mine. And I sort of said, oh, like, this is, this is really dumb. Like, I don't, I don't think that these AI models are really something to worry about. Um, but, like, I was still interested and, uh, and, and, and sort of was like, well, like, smart people I know think that AI is improving very rapidly. Um, and, and, and that might have a lot of impacts and might require a lot of sort of caution and thought and, and, and work to sort of make it safe. And, uh, and so that was actually a significant motivation for me getting involved. It was a mixture of sort of uh, there being a lot of potentially really intellectually interesting questions, um, liking to sort of switch fields every few years, um, and, uh, and friends of mine being, being very kind of concerned about this question. And, uh, and yeah, that, that was sort of what brought me in. Yeah. Are there ever things you see in your structure, you know, how models scale? What factor have you found has the most potential to throw off this scaling law from its natural force? Um, I mean, if we go back to sort of very basic ML ingredients um, of like, what are these things like? So if there's a sense in which this is all you're doing. You choose one of each of these five things. Um, I, I would guess that uh, what the objective is is most likely to sort of change things in the sense that predicting the next word is really sort of one of the laziest, sort of dumbest things you can do. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, there are all sorts of things. So it, it's really just chosen because you want to be able to compute, you want to be able to do backprop, and so you want to be able to t get some differentiable thing. You want to be able to get a lot of data for which you can compute this differentiable thing, and so, that, so, you, so you, that's, that's, that's the game that you're playing. Um, but I think that you can have other objectives like through reinforcement learning or, or some, other, some other kind of uh, active learning, whatever. I mean, some, some combination of such things. Um, and I, I sort of would just guess that uh, generally performance will change a lot more. Um, like if you're expecting sort of these trends to, to be very different, I would guess they're different if you have a different objective. I think changing the data distribution or the model might also change things, but, uh, but I think that like the lesson that I personally draw from something like this is that even if you found a like really revolutionary change that was like much better than transformers, um, it might be kind of equivalent to making transformers 10 times bigger, but, uh, but I'm not sure if that would be as big of a deal as, as changing the laws, um, changing what the objective is. But that's just my guess, I, I have no idea. Um, and of course, this paradigm, I mean, I think I was trying to be polite. I usually have like a picture of a grilled cheese here um, to emphasize like sort of how simple and, and sort of silly this is rather than this sort of very uh, sophisticated palette of spices. Um, and I mean, maybe someone will 
say, like, this isn't the right set of ingredients from which to think about things, and there's a different thing you should do, and maybe that will make a big difference as well, but uh, I, I, it, that's sort of an unknown unknown. <laughs>